Scorched Earth, Beyond the Digital Age to a Post-Capitalist World by Jonathan Crary. Uh, chapter one, this is the first part of the chapter. Yes, it's night and another world is rising. Harsh, cynical, illiterate, amnesic, revolving without reason. Spread out, flattened, as if perspective and vanishing point had been abolished. And the strange thing is that the living dead of this world are based on the world before. That was a quotation from Philippe Sollers. If there is to be a livable and shared future on our planet, it will be a future offline, uncoupled from the world-destroying systems and operations of 24-7 capitalism. In whatever endures of the world, the grid as we live within, to, within it today will have become a fractured and peripheral part of the ruins on which new communities and interhuman projects may possibly arise. If we're fortunate, a short-lived digital age will have been overtaken by a hybrid material culture based on both old and new ways of living and subsisting cooperatively. Now, amid intensifying social and environmental breakdown, there is a growing realization that daily life, overshadowed on every level by the internet complex, has crossed a threshold of irreparability and toxicity. More and more people know or sense this, as they silently experience its damaging consequences. The digital tools and services used by people everywhere are subordinated to the power of transnational corporations, intelligence agencies, criminal cartels, and a sociopathic billionaire elite. For the majority of the Earth's population on whom it has been imposed, the internet complex is the implacable engine of addiction, loneliness, false hopes, cruelty, psychosis, indebtedness, squandered life, the corrosion of memory, and social disintegration. All of its touted benefits are rendered irrelevant or secondary by its injurious and soci sociocidal impacts. The internet complex has become inseparable from the immense, incalculable scope of 24-7 capitalism and its frenzy of accumulation, extraction, circulation, production, transport, and construction on a global scale. Behaviors that are inimical to the possibility of a livable and just world are incited in almost every feature of online operations. Fueled by artificially manufactured appetites, the speed and ubiquity of digital networks maximize the incontestable priority of getting, having, coveting, resenting, envying, all of which further furthers the deterioration of the world a world operating without pause, without the possibility of renewal or recovery, choking on its heat and waste. The techno-modernist dream of, this, of the planet as a colossal worksite of innovation, invention, and material progress continues to attract defenders and apologists. Most of the many projects and, in, and industries of renewable energy are designed for perpetuating business as usual for maintaining devastating patterns of consumption, competition, and heightened inequality. Market-driven schemes such as the Green New Deal are absurdly pointless because they do nothing to switch off the expansion of senseless economic activity, the needless uses of electrical power, or the global industries of resource extraction incited by 24-7 capitalism. This book is aligned with a tradition of social pamphleteering that aims to give voice to what is experienced in common, to what is known or partly known in common, but is negated by an overpowering barrage or barrage of messages that insist on the unalterability of our administered lives. Many people on a daily basis have a visceral grasp of the immiseration of their lives and hopes but may only have a hesitant awareness of how widely their insights are shared with others. My goal here is not to present a nuanced theoretical analysis, but in a time of emergency, 
to affirm the truth of shared understandings and experiences and to insist that forms of radical refusal rather than adaptation and resignation are not only possible but necessary. The internet complex functions as an unending announcement of its indispensability and of the insignificance of whatever life remains unassimilable to its protocols. Its omnipresence and embeddedness within almost every sphere of personal and institutional activity makes any notion of its impermanence or post-capitalist marginalization seem unthinkable. <coughs> but this impression marks a collective failure of imagination and its passive acceptance of numbing online routines as synonymous with living. It is unthinkable only to the extent that our desires and our bonds with other peoples and species have been wounded and incapacitated. The philosopher Alain Badiou noted that it is at this point of apparent impossibility that the conditions for insurgency arise. Emancipatory politics always consists in making seem possible precisely that which from within the situation is declared to be impossible. The latter's voices declaring this impossibility are those who benefit from the perpetuation of the way things are, who thrive on the uninterrupted functioning of a capitalist world. These are anyone with a professional, financial, or narciss narcissistic stake in the ascendancy and expansion of the internet complex. How, they will ask incredulously, could we do without something on which every aspect of financial and economic life depends? Translated, this question is actually, how could we possibly do without one of the core elements of the techno-consumerist culture and economy that has brought life on earth to the edge of collapse? To have a world not dominated by the internet, they will say, would mean changing everything. Yes, precisely. Any possible path to a survivable planet will be far more wrenching than most recognize or will openly admit. A crucial layer of the struggle for an equitable society in the years ahead is the creation of social and personal arrangements that abandon the dominance of the market and money over our lives altogether. This means rejecting our digital isolation, reclaiming time as lived time, rediscovering collective needs and resisting mounting levels of barbarism, including the cruelty and hatred that emanate from online. Equally important is the task of humbly reconnecting with what remains of a world filled with other species and forms of life. There are innumerable ways in which this may occur, and although unheralded, groups and communities in all parts of the planet are moving ahead with some of these restorative endeavors. However, many of those who understand the urgency of transitioning to some form of eco-socialism or no-growth post-capitalism carelessly presume that the internet and its current applications and services will somehow persist and function as usual in the future, alongside efforts for a habitable planet and for more egalitarian social arrangements. There is, ana there is an anachronistic misconception that the internet could simply change hands as if it were a mid 20th century telecommunications utility like Western Union or radio and TV stations, which would be put to different uses in a transformed political and economic situation. But the notion that the internet could function independently of the catastrophic operations of global capitalism is one of the stupefying delusions of this moment. They are structurally interwoven and the dissolution of capitalism when it happens will be the end of a market-driven world shaped by the networked technologies of the present. Of course, there will be means of communication in a post-capitalist world, as there always have been in every society, but they will bear little resemblance to the financialized and militarized networks in which we are entangled today. The many digital devices and services we use now are made possible through unending exacerbation of economic inequality and the accelerated disfiguring of the Earth's biosphere by resource extraction and needless energy consumption. Capitalism has always been a conjunction 
of an abstract system of value and the physical and human externalizations of that system. But with contemporary digital networks, there is a more complete integration of the two. All of the interconnected phones, laptops, cables, supercomputers, modems, server farms, and cell towers are concretizations of the quantifiable processes of financialized capitalism. The distinction between fixed and circulating capital becomes permanently blurred, yet many remain attached to the fallacious image of the internet as a freestanding technological assemblage, like a set of tools, and the prevalence of handheld devices amplifies this illusion. In the early 1970s, the social critic Ivan Illich developed an expansive definition of a tool that included rationally designed artifacts, productive institutions, and engineered functions. Tools, he wrote, are intrinsically social, and he evaluated them in relation to a fundamental opposition. An individual relates himself in action to his society, either through the use of tools he actively masters, or by which he is passively acted upon. Illich insisted that people derive happiness and satisfaction through the use of tools that are least controlled by others, and warned that the growth of tools beyond a certain point increases regimentation, dependence, exploitation, and impotence. In the late 1990s, a few years before his death, he noted the disappearance of technique as a tool that was a means to an end, an instrument through which an individual could invest the world with meaning. Instead, he saw the spread of technologies into whose rules and operations people are integrated. Actions that once were at least partly autonomous now became system adapti adaptive behaviors. Within this historically unprecedented reality, any goals or ends we pursue cease to be ones we have truly chosen. For all its historical novelty, the internet complex is a magnification and consolidation of arrangements that have been operative or partially realized for many years. Hardly monolithic, it's a patchwork of elements from different eras made for a variety of uses, some of which are traceable back to the configurations for financializing flows of electricity devised in the 1880s by Edison and Westinghouse and then usurped by J.P. Morgan. Currently, we're witnessing the final act of the mad incendiary project of a totally wired world, of the reckless belief that 24-7 availability of electrical power to a planet of 8 billion people was achievable without the disastrous consequences now occurring everywhere. The near instantaneity of the internet's connectivity makes it a fulfillment of Marx's forecast in the 1850s, of a, global, of a global market. He saw the inevitability of a capitalist unification of the world in which constraints on the speed of circulation and exchange would be progressively diminished through the annihilation of space by time. Marx also understood that the development of a world market would necessarily lead to the dissolution of community and of any social relations independent of the universalizing tendency of capital. Thus, even if more pervasive now, the isolation associated with digital media is continuous with the social fragmentation produced by institutional and economic forces throughout the 20th century. Media materialities may change, but the same social experiences of separation, disempowerment, and disruption of community not only persist, but intensify. The internet complex quickly became an integral part of neoliberal austerity and its ongoing erosion of civil society and its replacement by monetized online simulations of social relations. It fosters the belief that we no longer depend on each other, that we are autonomous administrators of our lives, that we can manage our friends in the same way we manage all our online accounts. It also heightens what social theorist Elena Pulcini or Pulcini calls the narcissistic apathy of individuals emptied of desire for community and who live in passive conformity with the existing social order. Even since the late 1990s, we've heard repeatedly that the dominant digital technologies are here to stay. The master narrative that world civilization has entered the digital age promotes the illusion of a historical epoch whose material determinations 
are beyond any possible intervention or alteration. One result has been the apparent naturalization of the internet, which many now assume to be something immutably installed onto the planet. The numerous mystifications of information technologies all conceal their inseparability from the flailing stratagems of a global system in terminal crisis. Little is ever said about how the internet's financialization is intrinsically reliant on a house of cards world economy already tottering and threatened further by the plural impacts of planetary warming and infrastructure collapse. The initial claims of the internet's permanence and, and inevitability coincided with various end of history celebrations in which free market global capitalism was declared triumphant without rivals dominant in perpetu perpetuity. Even though in geopolitical terms, this fiction quickly exploded in the early 2000s, the internet seemed to validate the post-history mirage. It appeared to introduce a uniform, a a, a uniform default reality defined by consumption, unhinged from a physical world and its mounting social conflicts and environmental disasters. The advent of social media, with all its apparent opportunities for self-expression, briefly suggested a debased fulfillment of Hegel's horizon of autonomy and recognition for everyone. But now, as a constitutive component of 21st century capitalism, the Internet's key functions include the disabling of memory and the absorption of lived temporalities, not ending history, but rendering it unreal and incomprehensible. The paralysis of remembrance occurs individually and collectively. We see this in the transience of any analog artifacts that are digitized rather than preservation. Their fate is oblivion and loss, noted by no one. In the same way, our own disposability is mirrored in our self-defining devices that quickly become useless pieces of digital trash. The very arrangements that supposedly are here to stay depend on the ephem ephemerality, disappearance, and forgetting of anything durable or lasting to which there might be shared commitments. In the late 1980s, Guy Debord saw the perv pervasiveness of these temporalities. When social significance is attributed only to what is immediate and to what will be immediate immediately afterwards, always replacing another identical immediacy, it can be seen that the uses of the media guarantee an eternity of noisy insignificance. The transformation of the internet from a network used for several decades, mainly by military and research institutions into universally available online services in the mid 1990s did not happen simply because of, of advances in systems engineering. Rather, the shift occurred as an essential part of the massive reorganization of capital flows and the remaking of individuals into entrepreneurs of their human capital. The widespread introduction of informal, flexible, and decentralized forms of labor were noted by many, but in the early 1980s, a small number of commentators were able to grasp what was at stake on a deeper level. To take one example, the French economist Jean-Paul de Godemar in identified a fundamental reconfiguration of capitalism that involved far more than the reorganization of labor and the global dispersion of production. In effect, we are now living in an age in which it has become clear that capital must henceforth reconquer the entire social space from which the previous system had tended to separate it. It must now reincorporate this social body in order more than ever to dominate it. It would have been impossible for anyone in 1980 to foresee the concrete ways in which this reconquering would proceed or the relentlessness with which it continues decades later to subsume more and more layers of lived experience. Countless spheres of the social with their distinctive autonomies and local textures have disappeared or been standardized into online simulations. The internet complex is now the comprehensive global apparatus for the dissolution of society. Beginning in the mid-1990s, the internet complex was promoted as inherently democratic, decentralizing, and anti-hierarchical. It was said to be an unprecedented means for the free exchange of ideas, independent of top-down control, 
that would level the playing field of, me- of media access. But it was none of these. There was a short-lived phase of naive enthusiasm, similar to the unrealized hopes voiced at the wide availability of cable TV in the 1970s. The narrative now of an egalitarian technology endangered by mon- monopolistic corporations, the rescinding of net neutrality and invasions of privacy is plainly false. There never was or will be a digital commons. From the start, internet access for a global public was always about the capture of time, about disempowerment and depersonalized connectedness. The only reason the internet seemed freer or more open initially was because the projects of financializing and expropriation did not occur all at once and took a number of years to reach an acceleration point in the early 2000s. For transnational corporations, universal access to the internet allowed the reshaping of both uh, work and consumption into 24-7 occupations, freed from the constraints of time or location. This also created vast and interrelated possibilities of monitoring and solicitation of anyone online, and the simultaneous intensification of social privatization. Using the perspective of media historian Harold Innes, the corporate control of digital networks can be understood as a monopoly of knowledge, which serves the ambitions of a dominant empire or state, while seeming to provide popular or democratic access to information. Innes saw that the larger goal of communication systems throughout history has been to break up local and regional communities by drawing them into larger spheres over which the knowledge monopoly is maintained, thus ensuring cultural and economic domination. Rarely, he noted, did did subjugated groups ever effectively appropriate communications media for their own political ends. By the mid-1990s, the destabilization of work, intensifying economic inequality, dismantling of public services, structural creation of indebtedness, and many other factors required new ways of maintaining political docility. Limitless digital diversions were deterrent to the rise of anti-systemic mass movements. Part of the optimistic reception of the internet was the expectation that it would be an indispensable organizing tool for non-mainstream political movements leveraging the impact of smaller or marginal forms of opposition. In reality, the internet has proven to be a set of arrangements that prevent or close off even the tentative emergence of sustained anti-systemic organizing and action. Certainly, the internet can function instrumentally transmitting information to large numbers of recipients, for example, in aid of short-term single-issue mobilization, often linked to identity politics, color color revolutions, climate marches, or transient expressions of outrage. Also, it should be remembered that broad-based radical movements and far larger mass mobilizations were achieved in the 1960s and early 70s without any fetishization of the material means used for organizing. Accounts of the internet as an egalitarian, horizontal field of public spheres have deleted any class-based language or advocacy of class struggle at a historical moment when class antagonisms are as acute as ever. Indeed, the internet complex has never been deployed with even minor success in furthering an anti-capitalist or anti-war agenda. It disperses the disempowered into a cafeteria of separate identities, sects, and interests, and is especially effective at solidifying reactionary group formations. The insularity it produces becomes an incubator of particularisms, racisms, and neo-fascisms. Identity politics, as Nancy Fraser and others have argued, has been crucial to the strategies of progressive neoliberal elites to ensure that a potentially powerful majority cannot recognize itself being split into separate and competing factions from which a handful of representatives are allowed conspicuous entry into the meritocracy. The internet carries this strategy of highlighting diversity and encouraging compartmentalization to a new level of effectiveness. 
At the same time, the fact that social media can circulate only the most easily packaged ideas dilutes and domesticates potentially radical or insurgent programs, especially those which do not produce immediate results or which might require long-term engagement. Communication theorists have identified ways in which forms of media become steering mechanisms, serving to limit, shape, or redirect public debate. The internet has become the most infinitely nuanced and powerful of such steering mechanisms in the history of mass media. It would be difficult to find an ongoing conversation that has not been shaped by increasingly efficient mechanisms for orienting online exchanges and intervening in their content. Numerous activist groups have recognized the trap of social media after experiencing forms of sabotage, disruptions, and surveillance, as well as a weakening of trust and camaraderie among real-world communities of face-to-face -face participants. To take one of many examples, the Florida group Dream Defenders, formed in the aftermath of the 2012 murder of Trayvon Martin, suspended and subsequently marginalized their use of social media because of its del deleterious impact on their organization and its goals. In the words of one of their organizers, all of the fighting that happens on social media is indicative of the fact that people really don't know each other. Social media provides the illusion of deep relationships. So long as people don't really know each other, the work is never going to go that far. This is doing the work of Quintal Pro in the sense that you see people calling each other out online and you see all these rifts being created. Social media is doing that to us. Stepping back from all that is really important right now. We're in a really cr critical time where all of this could actually kill the movement. Being off social media is an opportunity for us to really understand how it's impacting us, how it's being used to, manip to manipulate us by our oppressor. An electoral politics based around involving people through internet solicitation, as some center-left parties in Europe have attempted, inevitably produces a depoliticization of those whose participation is the ostensible goal. Politics becomes continuous with the same gestures and keystrokes. The same recourse to surveys and opinion polls that strengthen one's integration into the routines of consumerism and self-administration. The result is one step forward, three steps back, unless the difficult task of creating new cooperative and communal forms of living becomes a political priority, all kinds of online activism will continue to occur innocuously without attaining any radical or foundational changes. Demonstrations, protests, marches take place, but simultaneously there is a re-immersion in the atomizing separation of digital life. The bonds that seem to have blossomed in the midst of action evaporate, even in the actual event of marches, occupations, liberated zones, and mobilizations of all kinds, group solidarity is reduced by the critical mass of individuals who are also elsewhere clinging to their devices and to the self-promotional resources of social media. Despite a small uptrend in openness to the possibilities of socialism in the U.S., it has mainly led to debate about candidates for electoral office and standalone economic initiatives. Missing has been the understanding that socialism cannot simply be implemented on the level of governmentality and economic policies but that, more importantly, building toward it requires changes in consciousness and everyday activity. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, many anarcho-socialists practiced ways of living and connecting with others that would prefigure or anticipate a larger social world of mutual support. During those years, especially in Europe, the flourishing of communal groups and workers' organizations provided foundations for deprivatized forms of coexistence and sharing of resources. For the German revolutionary Gustav Landauer, socialism is the continual becoming of community in humankind. It is action that carries its ends within itself. The capitalist state, he wrote, is a condition, a certain relationship between human beings, a mode of behavior. We destroy it by contracting other relationships by behaving differently. Landauer recognized the necessity of becoming new kinds of subjects, 
of making the difficult transition to prioritizing responsibility to others over the mirage of individual autonomy. Such a transition will never happen online. The internet overwhelmingly produces self-interested subjectivities, incapable of imagining goals or outcomes other than private individual ones. However, for the minority committed to social change, the idea of a radical transformation to modes of living is rarely prioritized over the sheltered habituations of online activity. As long as one panics at the idea of sharing and cooperating with others as a way of life, one is incapable of revolt and remains dependent on existing institutions. The truth is irrefutable. There are no revolutionary subjects on social media. The debacle is the folly of pursuing systemic change through the apparatuses that guarantee submission to the givens and rules imposed by those in power. Anyone inculcated with some of the political platitudes of postmodernism would insist the, op the opposite is true, that one can never occupy a position outside of the meshes of power, a diffuse power that extends everywhere and cannot be confronted. For many critics and academics, such a notion became a convenient basis for dismissing the possibility of revolt or militancy as outdated and unfashionable. Now the internet complex with all its tools for individual advancement and branding is the new self-serving delusion of the meshes of power from which use of ever-changing social media platforms can masquerade as opposition or resistance. The analysis by the Retort Collective in their 2004 book, Afflicted Powers, remains acutely relevant today, especially their discussion of the role of mass media in the fostering of obedience and apathy in the aftermath of 9-11. For these writers, the most significant feature of globalization is planet-wide militarization, and they described how the strategy of permanent war always seeks to normalize itself, to become unnoticed through familiarity and ubiquity. An unending sequence of military interventions had to be represented as an unexceptional part of the state's external political life in order to ensure the docility of domestic populations. Thus, they indicated the role of media apparatuses in fostering a callous unconcern with civi civilian casualties occurring in distant locations. Put simply, war facilitates the plunder of resources the securing of markets, and the creation of cheap and exploitable labor. The, the retort writers identified a two-pronged strategy of military intervention to produce failed states and regional instabilities in the periphery and using other less violent methods to promote, in to promote disinterested citizenship and compliant consumers in the core. No doubt they would have noted that, since the economic collapse of 2008, forms of state terror and economic immiseration have been brought home for deployment against many domestic communities and populations. In addition, it's possible now to recognize other features of that post-9-11 moment, which would not have been evident at the time. The strengthening of a permanent warfare, warfare state coincided with the installation and mass adoption of Web 2. 2.0, counterintuitively a configuration that supported user-generated content and supposedly enabled a participatory internet culture, was a factor in furthering the normalization of war and its invisibility to those millions of people cocooned online. Equally significant is the mass indifference to the quasi-permanent installation of U.S. military infrastructure across the entire planet. Except for a small number of activists, there is a broad refusal to even acknowledge the activities of the single largest developer, landowner, equipment contractor, and energy consumer in the world. Mass mobilizations against imperial wars had exerted at least a partial restraint on US, US foreign interventions, but the internet quickly contributed to the marginalization of resistance following the global protests in February 2003 against the impending invasion of Iraq. The sustained kind of struggle and solidarities demanded by an anti-war or anti-imperialist movement are irreconcilable with the temporalities and vacant forms of attentiveness that accompany the proliferation of social media. 
The current indifference to U.S. military interventions and to the looting of resources in the Global South must be viewed against the very different trajectory of international activism in the years 1994 to 2001. From the first Zapatista uprising to the anti-WTO demonstrations in Genoa, the anti-globalization movements were motivated by a conviction that defeating neoliberal capitalism had to be overriding objective, had to be the overriding objective, and the foundation for local or more circumscribed struggles. A 1998 manifesto of People's Global Action expressed this priority. We have to start aiming at the head. We have been militants fighting against nuclear power, against homelessness, against sexism, different tentacles of the monster. But you are never really going to do it that way. You have to aim at the head. The momentum generated by the events of, C of, of Seattle, Genoa, and elsewhere was in part derailed by the 9-11 related cancellation of IMF World Bank meetings in Washington, D.C., scheduled for late September 2001. Now, 20 years later, in a changed world, that earlier focus and strategic clarity of global anti-capitalist movements continue to be dispersed into a medley of particularized grievances. And a recent look back at the 1999 anti-capitalist demonstrations in Seattle, the anarchist activist Chris Dixon detailed the months of collective organizing ahead of the WTO meetings involving thousands of people who went into high schools, churches, labor councils, neighborhood associations, workplaces, and universities to form affinity groups and to test out creative forms of direct democracy and a community-based struggle. His account is perhaps unintentionally a harsh verdict on the shallowness and inadequacy of activism based on internet and social media strategies. Near the end of his life in 2007, Jean Baudrillard observed that the logic of Western modernity required that it be imposed on the entire world, that no peoples or places should escape its demands. The West, he writes, exports its economic and cultural models everywhere in the name of universality, but it is a nullifying universality, emptied of any truths, leaving in its wake all that has been desacralized, unveiled, objectified, financialized. It is a challenge to the rest of the world to debase themselves in their turn, to deny their own values, to sacrifice everything by which a human being or a culture has some value in its eyes, its own eyes. But what Baudrillard identifies here was well underway much earlier, as Aimé Césaire's 1995 account of European colonization makes clear. They talk to me about progress, diseased, cured, highways built, improved standards of living. I am talking about societies drained of their essence, cultures trampled underfoot, institutions undermined, lands confiscated, religious, religions smashed, magnificent artistic creations destroyed, extraordinary possibilities wiped out. The social atomization of the internet reproduces something intrinsically American in its relentless maximization of acquisitiveness and the illusory independence it seems to promise the user and its capacity for one-way communication, freed up from dialogue or reciprocity and detached from a physical place. As Bernard Stiegler and others have argued, the internet complex incarnates a specifically American model of technological consumption, to which there has been little or no resistance in Europe and elsewhere, resulting in the liquidation of regional or national cultures. For Stiegler, one of the innovations exported by the US in technology for the mass production of behavior and for a hyper synchronization of consciousness, which has led to the to the decomposition of the social as such. The hegemonic rule of the market in which calculation and computation are extended into every area of life makes it impossible for an individual to love oneself or love others or to have any desire for the future. All the seemingly altruistic fervor about overcoming the digital divide continues to be a unified campaign by corporate interests to require digital compliance everywhere including the use of computer-based learning in schools for even the youngest of students. 
the suggestion has been that people without broadband access are living in a condition of deprivation, cut off from the possibility of upward mobility, career opportunities, and cultural enrichment. However, the primary goal of the most powerful stakeholders is the event eventual uh, transformation of everyone into captive and obedient consumers of their products and service. The unspoken truth is that as internet access and use expands, economic inequality is heightened, not diminished. Tech literacy is a euphemism for shopping, gaming, binge watching, and other monetized and addictive behaviors. Wealthy, cynical power brokers like Nicholas Negroponte, founder of MIT Media Lab, pontificate, or pontificate about making internet access a human right, while corporate-friendly agendas promote a laptop for every child, despite the unmitigated failures of computer-based education in elementary schools. However, the juggernaut of high-tech companies marketing their products and services in the global south and elsewhere has had more injurious consequences. The violent processes of Western modernization have always targeted the survival of local or regional singularities. In nations or areas in which traditional or indigenous solidarities persist, the internet complex becomes a new techno-colonization, ripping apart long-standing forms of social cohesion. Now, even its partial installation introduces another layer of homogenization, but this time at the level of consciousness. The reality of intensifying global polarization and inequality is continually disguised by mainstream media fabrications of a planet happily coming closer together through the technology we share. Thus, we are told how First Nations fishermen in Labrador use GPS software to route their boats, how Indigenous communities in Australia use Facebook to tell their stories, how textile artists in Zimbabwe sell their goods on Etsy and eBay, and how MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, are bringing enlightenment and prosperity to North Africa and the Middle East. Implicit in these accounts is that the civilizing impact of the internet will lift the disadvantaged out of their technological limitations, allowing them to become like us. Such journalism is not just feel-good. We are the world reassurance that all is heading in the right direction. It's also a disclosure of the deeper-rooted colonizing premise that the poor regions of the periphery desire and welcome the adoption of Western technology, including social media, and that they will necessarily benefit from its implantation. For political theorist Samir Amin, this is the legacy of Eurocentrism at its worst, that is, of capitalism putting forward a model of material abundance that is structurally impossible to achieve and is never in fact its actual goal. Once the lure of Western modernization is accepted, what follows only perpetuates and intensifies unequal relations. As Enrique Dussel and others have argued, we are now in the last stages, not just of capitalism, but of the entire European world system that has been in place for nearly 500 years, based on the exploitation and murder of non-European peoples and the natural world. The internet complex as the new modality of planetary administration is an indispensable part of the defensive strategy to maintain the world system, to resist decolonization and de-westernization. Its global availability makes it an essential part of all the economic and military efforts to counter the hard realities of geography in which North America is on the literal and symbolic periphery of an emerging post-Western planet. As Dussel insists, the defeat of this world system with its threat to the survival of all life is now the single greatest task of humanity. Capitalism's unlivable temporalities infuse the conditions of working and living together with desperation and hopelessness. Everything necessary for a minimal sense of stability, whether jobs, homes, communities, or healthcare, is by design always on the edge of being discarded downsized, foreclosed, demolished. This where the sociopathology of capitalism becomes more virulent. Franco Berardi and others have discussed how neoliberalism and its technological armature 
produce new manifestations of psychosis on a global scale. For Berardi, we're living in a time of annihilating nihilism, in which the disintegration of long-standing forms of social solidarity are inseparable from epidemics of depression, addiction, and suicide. The anger, the cruelty, and the avowals of victimhood that pervade the internet continue to spill out into real space and ever more frequent episodes of mass violence. Especially in the U.S., an underlying creed of resentment, individualism, and freedom from responsibility to others begets its now familiar monsters. Here, alongside all the commodities we are exhorted to covet, one product stands apart, the gun. The gun symbolically and too often in actuality redeems the hollowness of a material culture that produces powerlessness and disappointment. A gun does not wear out and rarely needs repair. For many, it is the reassuring inverse of all the shoddy objects and broken relationships that pass in and out of one's life. Most of all, the gun and its inherent lethality becomes the last guarantee of a society of equals and the frightful specter of a vanished individual agency. In the 1970s, madness was often understood as a condition which mirrored the dislocations of capitalism, but was simultaneously a delirium of interruption, of escape that held at least some radical potential. As Deleuze and Guattari argued in Anti-Oedipus, we see this mapped out in 1970s fictions such as Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time, Doris Lessing's Briefing for a Descent into Hell, and Leslie Silko's Ceremony, where these authors explore how madness instigates the breakouts, the departures to other experiences of time and desire, and to rediscoveries of community. Now, four decades later, capitalism's harsh levelings and liquidations are more invasive and widespread than in the 1970s. Madness finds fewer pathways to flight or break out to an elsewhere. The involuntary immersion in 24-7 temporalities heightens a pervasive condition of quasi-psychosis, bereft of anything fugitive or nomadic. Ludwig Binswanger, writing in the 1950s, outlined it as follows. What is renounced is life as independent, autonomous selfhood. The subject thus renders itself over to existential powers alien to itself. In this account, schizophrenia is a withdrawal from being in the world, from life as something lived communally, and is experienced as a condition in which one's existence is worn away, as though by friction. For Deleuze and Guattari, the schizo is first of all the one who can no longer bear all that. Money, the stock market, values, morals, homelands, religions. Now, decades later, all that includes an obligatory digital identity, passwords, 24-7 engagement with online media, and the monetization of all aspects of working or living. The madness is compounded by repeated declarations by seemingly knowledgeable voices that this is all here to stay, and there is no other way to live. Although some of the celebratory fabrications about cyberspace are still given lip service, it's clear that the internet never was a collective apparatus that could dismantle hierarchical institutions, reconfigure power relations, and enable a plurality of once marginal voices to be heard and empowered. With those illusions abandoned, the broad acceptance of present arrangements as necessary and inevitable comes as much from resignation and fatigue as from the impossibility of life-affirming and non-financialized uses of the internet complex. In the 1990s, some argued that amid the precarious circumstances of work and life within the global economy, there was enormous insurgent potential latent within the communicative and information technologies immediately at hand. Some claimed that mobile labor and fragmented forms of work, at least in principle, could be the basis for a general creativity and even resistance that might disturb existing political relations. This hope was based on the supposition that individual activity within networks necessarily interacted or converged with the work of many others. There was anticipation that collaborative exchanges and shared inventiveness might overcome the disconnectedness that had long been part of the industrial division of labor and might have the potential to develop into new forms of political struggle. But such optimistic speculation was based on a model of the workplace 
and on a notion of immaterial labor that bore little, re little resemblance to the actual circumstances of workers as austerity, as austerity measures intensified. Now, two decades later, the reality of low-wage labor using digital technology is of repetitive and physically enervating tasks, subject to harsh time management and productivity surveillance. The prospect of cooperative networks or online peer-to-peer -peer exchanges leading to effective political agency has given way to the pervasive realities of workplace isolation, despair, and threat of disposability. Gig economy workers have little to share with each other, but their destitution and exhaustion. Since the 1990s, there has been a further breakdown of separations between work time and non-work time between public and private time, making the creation of political or civic community difficult or impossible to achieve. Portions of life that had once been demarcated as private or personal become an unending chain of online obligations that are in force at all waking hours. Edward Snowden's spurious claim that network technology is the great equalizer perpetuates an elitist hacker fantasy of covert empowerment that has little relevance to most people's lives or to the building of mass movements and new communities. The internet complex is obviously fraught with social contradictions, but there's no way a dialectical analysis can conjure it into a locus or set of tools for class struggle. To suggest that the internet is where indigenous peoples, stateless immigrants, the unemployed and impoverished, and the incarcerated should contest their marginalization and dis disposability is not just wrong, but malevolently irresponsible. Proponents of modernization and development in the 20th century were strident champions of massification, whether of society, culture, or business. Advocates of small human scale social formations or undertakings were ridiculed as nostalgic or reactionary. The exalting of the mass has always been about the financialization of large demographics. Although its relocation from the physical space of the crowd and of production to the internet has had new effective consequences. The crushing asymmetries of scale between an individual person and global networks disfigure any non-quantified notions of importance or value. Each of us is demeaned by the veneration of statistics followers, clicks, likes, hits, views, shares, dollars, that, fabricated or not, are an ongoing rebuke to one's self-belief. When the availability of images and information is infinite, there is a fatal scattering of anything held in common, and the relationships that make possible a society are dissolved. The phenomenon of something trending or going viral is a mass surge of a vague and amorphous unanimity of an irresistible but vacuous ascent to some trivia or pseudo-outrage which is quickly forgotten and leaves no trace. Drained of intentionality, it becomes a monstrous and disempowering simulation of a collective pronouncement. The philosopher Roberto Unger has argued that belittlement is the inevitable lot of human beings in a social world, where most people experience a lifelong gap between their own desires and hopes and the extent to which these are ever recognized or fulfilled by society. The immeasurable dimensions of the internet, however, become a new intensification of belittlement in the humiliating effacement of any individual gesture of self-affirmation. In seeking antidotes to belittlement, Unger observes that we fall into the sleepwalking of compromise, conformity, and the petrified self. We seize upon devices and stratagems that divide us and enslave us under the pretext of empowering us.